Waiguji ga kalsa, waiguji ga fate. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Media Watch. I'm your host, Dr. Savi, and with me I have a very special guest. I'd like to introduce you to Navjot uh, Sidhu QC. And uh, Navjot will tell us all about what he does. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Savi, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to the show. I know that you're interested in discussing some very uh, topical issues that have been circulating around the world. Um, I think you've introduced me uh, as a QC, and I thought you would be interested to know the sort of work Absolutely, that I do. Yeah. It's not uh, just about wearing the robes. Then, no, it's it? not just about wearing the robes, although that is um, one of the perks of my job. It's a little frilly well, white we get bit. to wear a fancy dress. Absolutely. Yeah, so you, yeah, you're yeah. wearing your pug and I get to wear a wig. <laughs> so it's the closest I come <laughs> to actually covering my head when I'm at work during the day. But, uh, Savi, I, I represent people who are charged with very serious criminal offences. So as a Queen's Counsel, it means I do the sorts of cases that you read about in the papers or on television. You watch um, murders and terrorism offences and big drugs cases, the sorts of things that uh, make for good newsprint. Um, and so most of my day is spent actually defending people who are charged with these very serious crimes. Um, today I was at the Old Bailey uh, dealing with a, uh, a case involving firearms murder, uh, an alleged contract killing. So um, it's that side of life which most people don't tend to come contact with very much uh, that I get to, to deal with, um, but uh, the sort of thing which I've always felt is very important because, you know, our legal system in this country has developed over many centuries and it's the pride uh, of uh, many jurisdictions across the world. It's quite interesting actually because would you say that a lot of uh, countries have modelled themselves on the, the way that the British uh, have, you know, put in legal systems and legal processes? Absolutely. Well, as you know, I mean, Britain uh, effectively ruled half the world at one point as its empire spread across the globe. And, and as it did so, including in places like India, it, it sort of instituted its own systems of administration and legal systems. So India, for example, uh, follows a common law system in the same way that we have here. Uh, and many of the laws that we uh, apply here are mimicked elsewhere. So I, I was just um, I was thinking a second ago that uh, one of those Bollywood films when, uh, you know, the first thing they say is Malad. Yes. Yeah. So well, the Bollywood films, so, I'll tell you, yeah. well, uh, are, quite, are quite funny for people like me to watch yeah. because all they ever consist of when they do those courtroom dramas. Okay. And there's one central lawyer that will kind of... No, uh, there's two, two lawyers and they're yeah. normally shouting at each other yeah, at the exactly. top of their voice or yeah. shouting at the judge or shouting at a witness. Right. Not something I could get away with in the old Bailey, I can tell you. Absolutely. Okay, well, hopefully we, there won't be any shouting today uh, when we continue with the format of the show. Uh, the whole purpose of this particular event and show that we do every week we try and bring you a roundup of the world news not to seek news uh, we also cover off uh, specifically a, a main headline and there's a, a very important headline that we need to cover off today um, Shimshir Singh is sometimes with us and uh, he tells us about an event in history well again you know we will continue with that sad theme about what happened in June in 1984 and uh, followed on in November 1984 with the genocide that took place I'd like to discuss that in detail. Um, so let's start off with the first part of the show and we look at the main headline. Well, we can't really continue without uh, talking about 1984, but before we do that, uh, we're gonna talk about the fact that it also happens to be a coincidence that on the 20, uh, this is 25 years, and at the moment over in Hong Kong, there's been a demonstration, which apparently in China uh, it is not allowed to demonstrate against the Communist Party there. But 25 years ago, we saw a situation where in Tiananmen Square, the country actually, uh, the forces at the time who represented the political powers were there uh, shooting into the crowd. And a lot of people actually left that country and it's still suppressed today. Uh, I believe that there are people who have uh, written books and novels who have won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, but yet they are not kept in public view because it's not deemed to be uh, a thing to talk about. Now, China has moved on in some sense, and everyone wants to court them from a business perspective, but it's always important to remember the uh, negativity that happened there to say, well, did those lives actually go in vain, or is there an opportunity for China to change over time? I saw a recent news article that suggested that maybe uh, the generation that's there at the moment are obviously enjoying a kind of a cross between communism and capitalism, but uh, are they going to ask the same questions as more and more freedom and liberty comes to the country? So um, what's your view on that, um, Navjot? Tell me, what, do you think that that country, China, would change? Like I said before, a lot of people are quite in the, in the area of courting them for the amount of money that they've got and the successful economy, that, or the economic model that they have at the moment. Well, China, as we know, is a major international global power. 
and exerts a lot of muscle economically throughout the world. You know, for example, Savi, Savi that uh, China holds a great deal of American debt, and to it that does. extent the Americans are in hock to the Chinese. But the Chinese are a curious entity as a country because you've got there no democracy in, in any sense that is meaningful to you and I. Um, there are no elections where you have an alternative between political parties. It's been a one-party state since its inception. And at the same time, you have in China this huge amount of economic growth. I mean, it's one of the fastest growth rates Absolutely. in the world. Yeah. and has been for a long time now, faster than India. And so at some point, you can imagine, as the Chinese population become more and more wealthy, at least some people in China become more and more wealthy, there will become an increasing expectation that the political model that they've had for all these decades will have to reflect the economic power that individuals are beginning to exert. But of course, it's a very interesting thing because in China, although people say it has very high levels of growth, the per capita income of the ordinary Chinese, and there are 1.2, 1.3 billion of them, is not that high. So you've got a huge peasantry, you've got a huge working class in China who are working in overcrowded cities, uh, producing the sort of white goods, you know, the refrigerators and washing machines that we take for granted in all of our outlets in this country. And those people are not earning a lot of money, but there is a, a very wealthy elite in China, as wealthy, if not more wealthy, than many other elites across the world, including America and Britain, who, in fact, earn a disproportionate amount of their national income. And this is where you're going to find there's a problem, because as those wealthy people more and more uh, show that they have the means to buy whatever they like, ordinary Chinese are going to say, well, hang on, we may be a very big and powerful country, but what about us? Are we going to have some, some income that we can enjoy? And most importantly, are we going to have a say in the future direction of our country? Do you, do you think, though, that um, I saw a really good uh, documentary on, on the BBC called yeah. Ant People, yeah. and, and they described themselves as Ant People, and this is kind of like, almost like there was an elite group that yeah. went to some of the top universities, and there's massive competition, not down to population, but it's down to the system that's there about being able to get a degree that's either from a particular university or not. And yes. we have that to a certain extent, whether in the US and you're in Ivy League universities or in the UK when you go to Oxford or Cambridge. Yeah. Um, and to a certain extent, it's unfair. Yeah. Uh, and to a certain extent, it's kind of giving opportunity for people who might want to delve deeper into a subject. Yeah. But this is on a different extreme. Yeah. I wondered if there's two issues here. One is the fact that you have education. Does it automatically bring about greater awareness and understanding, um, assuming that you have access to that knowledge, mm -hmm. so you have more philosophies to look at, where you go, well, actually, maybe that system is not the right system for us, so people start questioning. Yeah. But on the other end, um, you know, there's a frustration that may grow in that country if not everyone's given an opportunity yeah. to get a job or they've got a degree or um, it's a competitive thing where uh, people being targeted to actually get into certain universities yeah. and uh, and this was what the program brought out sure. that there was almost like a, uh, a kind of capitalist way that these individuals were working to try and recruit people from the farms to do these courses and some of those college colleges didn't even exist yeah. you know so it's kind of like a, a you know a very complex you know. Well, there is. I mean, look, the, the reality is when you've got a country which is about four times the population of the entirety of Europe uh, and you have a disparity of income that you've got in China, there's going to be brewing up frustrations amongst people. The reality is that people in China who have a good education, not just those who go to the big universities in China, but who export their children abroad. And we have lots of Chinese students in Britain, in America, Canada and other advanced countries. They have the means to be able to access very high quality education. And it becomes a virtuous circle. As those children of those oligarchs uh, become more educated, they bring that back to China and Absolutely. they begin they to bring invest ideas. in education. Absolutely. The what you've got is a time bomb. You've got a time bomb because the reality is ordinary Chinese, and we're talking about the vast majority of ordinary Chinese, simply have no access to that level of education. It's not a sustainable model, if it's you not. think about it for one no. moment. In no. a sense, we've got a similar situation in India. But it's not as severe because you have a safety valve in India, which is democracy. In now, some people, it's an imperfect <laughs> democracy. Well, it's, yeah. Theoretically or practically, it's a democracy in the sense that people are allowed to go out and vote and they get a choice between different parties. No country in the world has a perfect democracy, sorry. We don't have a perfect democracy. Yeah, but what I would say, let's come back to this, uh, and you mentioned India, because the next thing we're going to talk about yeah. is India, uh, is, you know, you have uh, what one of the uh, favorite, very famous stat uh, statisticians who was talking about population and, and how in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, we might see a growth in the fact that we might reach 8 billion people around the world. But if you look at it, you know, you talk, talk about per capita, if you look at it in terms of how much money there is yeah. in, in the system, 
uh, even today and even in uh, earlier times, 95% of the world's wealth is held by a select group of people. Yes, a very small and minority. It's a small minority. Yeah. You know, 5% is by the rest of us. Yeah. And, you know, you, you get into a situation of have, haves and have yachts. You know, and the have yeah. yachts, you're not going to be able to get to. Yeah. But the way this statistician actually put it was, and I see this in India, and I see that in, in developing countries, is there's the flip-flops, right? And then you get the next stage after that. The flip-flops are people who've got nothing, basically. Mm -hmm. This is his categorization. Flip-flops, then you follow that by somebody who's got a bike. Then someone's got a car, yeah. and someone who's got uh, possibly more than one car. Yeah. Then they're living in a, in a house, or they're living in a skyscraper. The ones that, who are in the skyscrapers can't see the flip-flops, and the flip-flops are saying, it's going to be so difficult for me to actually get up there because I just think it's too high up in terms of, I mean, obviously, that's, it's kind of more of a materialistic model, yeah. but the point is made that the neither party, the polarization that exists in that community mm -hmm. um, of all of them together, it is impossible to bridge the gap. Now, in his population analysis, what he says is that if, even though it might be an increase in two billion, it's the older population that will be the one that's of, of focus, as well as kind of... Uh, birth rate control and all the rest of it. Um, and if you look at a model like India, you know, you do find the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. If you look at a model in China that we talk about, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. So let's, let's just move on for a second to the other part of the news. I would say the biggest thing that we have at the moment is to talk about that this happens to be the week of the 30th year of um, we're commemorating the 1984 situation in Amritsar. We had uh, a massacre that took place in the Golden Temple. Now, we're not going to discuss in detail, you know, what were the, uh, you know, who was in there and what actually took place and the kind of earlier stuff uh, in absolute detail. But if we look at the central issues behind this, uh, clearly it was to help that particular uh, population in Punjab, in the north, whether you be a Hindu or a Sikh. And try and pitch this as being a Hindu Sikh thing, whereas really whoever was in there uh, was trying their best to raise the profile. And there are arguments behind the fact that where did he come from, what did he do, why was he there, what's the defense mechanism that took place. But the amount of effort that was used to really go into the Golden Temple, even the fact that on that day it happened to be Guru Arjan Dev Ji's martyrdom day, and there were many people that were there uh, who were just killed, and if you look at the eyewitness accounts, um, it was, uh, the, the figures don't add up in terms of who was in there and who died and the, and the uh, media blackout that took place. So we don't really know the absolute truth of what actually took place. But if you look at the photographic evidence of what happened, it is pure devastation. So, like I said, I mean, the surrounding facts of this were that it wasn't just an issue that started off, you know, two years before by one particular person. Yeah. You know, you have the Anandpur mm -hmm. uh, resolution, you have uh, post-1947 where greater autonomy was offered, there was a water issue, there was an electricity issue. All these things seem to be kind of put aside. Yeah. But I wonder, when you look at, um, you know, things like this happens to be uh, the 70th year of the D-Day celebrations um, in terms of the freedom and the commemoration. Celebration in terms of freedom, uh, commemoration in terms of the people that lost their lives. Um, you know, there's a difference between how some of that is reported. And globally, um, I think I was just talking to somebody just now, there is a, a column apparently in uh, the mail, um, I think it was today, um, and there isn't anything anywhere else. I've, I've looked really hard, I've looked internationally to look at the headlines and see what was actually spoken about, um, about this particular event. And there doesn't seem to be anything on any of the... the, the the newsstands that talks about what happened and, and why it was important to kind of raise this again and why it is um, the way that it was done uh, is not even discussed either and the background the history um, it, it just seems to be missing of the uh, the media agenda well what, Sophie, I what's, mean, your, what's your view it, it, on that uh, well Sophie, if, looking at it realistically and we're sitting here in London yeah uh, in England uh, one's not surprised that British media are going to cover Issues that they think are relevant to the people. Yeah, but who they, are they cover it. they cover things like Tiananmen Square. No, you know? they they do. When they, when when Tiananmen Square was happening, I remember watching it. I remember being a student at the time. Yeah, I'm it, talking about this week. Yes, but know, th this they, week they this covered week, Tiananmen Square. They, they may have covered Tiananmen Square because they had an angle on it, but they regarded it as more important because perhaps they think China is more important to them as a as a country that they want to look into. The reality is, Chinese people who died in Tiananmen Square, who are 1.2 billion in number in total is a big population. The Western media don't regard the Sikh community as a big population. 
They regard them as a relatively small population, which is what they are numerically. Mm. So they don't give them that sort of attention. But the real issue is, is this, is that you've got a lot of coverage, saturation coverage today uh, and over this week about D-Day because the British people want to talk about the fact that they, they won the war, uh, they beat the Germans, the Americans came and sided with the British and how everyone came together and we should celebrate how, how great Britain was in, in defeating uh, Nazism. And it is important to recognize that. But Britain today is, is a composite of so many different cultures and peoples that one has to also reflect the fact that individual communities have gone through their own pain and their own experiences. When Jewish people were killed in millions in the Holocaust, that is something which is recognized still till this day. So, so it's okay to recognize, and any, any uh, yes. genocide or pogrom... Yeah, you've you know, got to and, have some... And pogrom is, is kind of got its basis you, in, in Judaism uh, You've got as to well. have some parity. And the yeah. reality, and I agree with you, because I think the sentiment that you're expressing at the moment is that there isn't any parity. Mm. So we're having effectively... Is, is there like blackout. a pecking order or some kind? I don't know if there's a pecking order, because that would suggest that there's some sort of uh, coordination by the media to decide what is, what is and what isn't newsworthy. Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the media are going to put out what they think is going to be the most highly consumed stories, okay, because they are money-making operations. If they don't feel that what happened in June of 1984 in Amritsar is a big enough story to sell to the public, then they won't run it. The question for us as people from the Sikh community is what are we doing ourselves to ensure that these issues remain at the top or near the top of the agenda? Sikhs are an established community in this country. They've made a huge contribution. They have an entitlement to expect that issues which are close to their heart Painful issues like June 1984, painful issues are also recognized in the media as something that needs to be looked into. Now we need to have documentaries. We should have documentaries by Panorama and other investigative programs to say, let's go back into these issues and understand why a lot of sick people today, 30 years on, still feel such angst, such pain, such sense of affrontery about what had happened. Is it well-founded? Is it not well-founded? But you're right, it deserves more attention from the media. Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, if you look and you, again, we know, we see what actually happened at the time. There's pure devastation. But there almost was, and, and this is my personal view on this, uh, an intent to really dampen the community. Why would you go into a complex, use bombs and shells that would really cause major, major, I mean, this is like, if you look at the number of uh, tanks that had gone in there, this is like, you know, any kind of tank is bad, but there were quite a lot of tanks that had gone in there. Um, the Sikh reference library was burnt. There were certain artifacts that were stolen and are still in the custody of the, of the government. They haven't been returned. There's never been, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a, a minute silence in Parliament to say, you know, we remember the, the people that died at, at that time. Um, whether or not they agree or disagree with what was going on, the fact that there was a lot of innocent individuals that were in the complex well, at the time. you're forgetting yeah. something really important. Because remember, not only a few months ago, one of the big news stories that was going out in Britain was about the fact that the British government under Mrs. Thatcher Had were sent. arguably complicit, yes. complicit in what took place during what was called Operation Blue Star. Yeah. So these two, these got, one has to keep in mind that there's a reason why there's a defensiveness in the British establishment and in political circles about going back into this issue, particularly in light of what was disclosed after many, many years of suppression, the documents which show that Mrs. Thatcher... And documents that are and not Mrs. there anymore. Had, 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 had and, and documents that also seem to be mysteriously disappeared as and, well. And the, well yeah. you, know, you know, of course, that yeah. the, 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 effectively the, the, the cabinet 20, secretary... The 20-year rule, the 30-year rule... The, the, rule, absolutely, the cabinet know. secretary has had to do a report on this. And there are a number of groups and lawyers, lawyers who are not even from a sick background, who feel actually this is such an important issue to get to the bottom of the truth in this matter that we should continue to dig and dig and dig until we find out what really happened between the British government and Indian government. But this, in a sense, comes back to what you were saying about why is it that these stories don't get the sort of publicity and airing that they really deserve. And you have to remember that there's a reason why, partly because there was a, a blackout on information about the role of the British government. And once that blackout was, was lifted to some extent, what we've been given in terms of disclosure has been so limited, we still have to keep asking questions. I think the really important role for those of us who are engaged, either as lawyers like myself or commentators and pundits like yourself, is to keep asking questions which are awkward. The only way you ever get to the truth is by asking awkward sure. questions. And, I, and we can go into the merits of whether or not, you know, the degree of overkill in the operation that took place, whether it should have happened at all in June of 84, and I, I remember it well because I was a student in Southall in my school, Villiers High School. Right. I, was, I was 18 years old, I was taking my A-levels, and it was the biggest thing that had happened for the Sikh community in Southall to deal with this. And I remember the reports coming from India, Mark Dully, yeah. who was the BBC journalist, was reporting from India, and this was huge for us. It was covered at the time. 
But since that time, as the years have passed, there's been a veil that's been drawn across it as if to say, it doesn't really matter anymore, we shouldn't go into it. So when you talk about the uh, anti-Sikh genocide in Delhi yeah. in November of 1984, I remember that very well too. And the fact that there isn't much discussed about it anymore, you can understand why a lot of Sikhs feel, well, we've been incredibly restrained. We've been very polite about this, but really, is it fair that we should continue to say nothing about this or shouldn't we be asking questions? Now, this isn't about taking sides. It's not about saying, I am you know, a Khalistani or I am not a Khalistani. This is not what the discussion is about. For those of us who believe that the truth matters, it's not about politics. But is it, isn't it's it about, about the human truth. rights then as well? Well, human rights is about yeah. truth, right? Yeah. Human rights is about ensuring that the truth is understood in how people are treated. Human rights means get to the bottom of what's really going on right. and then ask yourself, is that person being treated as a, as a human being should? Are their rights being protected by the countries that they are in? Are, uh, is the legal system taking seriously their complaints? Is the executive of a country investigating their complaints? Are the politicians who are there ultimately to decide what the laws of a country are, are they taking these issues into the heart of government and saying, look, if it matters to such a, an important and significant part of our population, whether it's in India or it's in Britain, shouldn't we be reflecting this? These are, after all, citizens of our country. They are, after all, constituents. Where are the politicians whom we elect? Let's take a simple example. In this country, we have a limited number of Asian politicians. And in fact, we have next to no almost Sikh politicians. So we don't really have true diversity. Who, in fact, has taken up these issues within the chamber of the House of Commons and said, actually, I want to have a real debate about this issue because it matters to my constituents? Have you heard anyone Well, I would this? say that if you were cynical, you'd say that the ones that do take it up, if you were cynical, uh, would be the ones that have high populations of Sikh uh, individuals or Sikh communities, and therefore it's a vote player, right? If I was somebody who thought that uh, it's important to them, it, they feel that it's that passionate about human rights as as Sikhs do, because that's in our blood, in one sense, that we do defend the defenseless. That's what we're brought up yes. to do. Yeah. You know, um, you know, someone's on the, on the fallen over, we will go over and try and help yeah. them out. Human rights are part of the yeah. DNA of what, yeah. what it the is Sikh part of the DNA. Is it it resonates in other every... religions too, but it's Absolutely. very much about protecting those who are not from our So I, I would say, to answer your question directly about who actually takes up the, the issues, well, there are a few that do, right? But do we do ourselves any favours in terms of being portrayed in society as being individu individuals that contribute? And I think that what happens is that it's a choice pick situation. You know, it's, it's kind of like, well, you know, this week it will be reasonable to, to feature the fact that, you know, Castle Aid happened to be in um, Somerset, and that, isn't that a great thing, yeah. right? Um, and, and, but then again, it may be forgotten the week after. But persistently, if you look across the community, and I, did, uh, I was recently at one of the Sikh channel programs called Punta Time, and, and someone was talking about the Sikh institutions. Yeah. You know, how many institutions are there in the UK? I can count probably about 20 of them straight away. You know, there's SACA, there's, yeah. you know, Sikh uh, Aid, there's, you know, um, there's SWAT. Yeah. All these organisations are doing different things for different people uh, and different parts of society. But, Sonny, oh, but media don't organisations don't work like that, yeah. right? So media organisations don't work on the basis that the media go out and find the unsung heroes. Sure. What they do is they wait for the unsung heroes who start singing right. to come forward and saying, hey, okay. look well, at maybe, what Maybe no, our no, nature is to be no, humble. No, this is the issue. Yeah. This is the issue. Those people like Khalsa Aid and organisations who have brought massive and huge and deserved credit to their communities, showing that they are engaging with the wider population, not saying we're just going to do seva in their individual gurdwaras, right, but going to places like Somerset with a lot of English white people absolutely. who don't know them yeah. and saying, look, we're here to help you. Okay? Those people actually abide by the core principles of, of Sikhism, which is to remove ego to remove ego from what you do, to do something which is genuinely selfless, not expect it to be reflected in the media because you want to have some, some applause or some recognition. Absolutely. They are yeah. genuine heroes. But those of us who know how the system works, understand media like your good self, I think have a responsibility to say, well, if the mainstream media are not in fact uh, recognizing the contribution that these guys and women are doing, why shouldn't we push them out there? I think we do have that responsibility actually. Right, given, um, given an opportunity I would say as well, um, and, I, and I have to put that caveat on top. In, yeah. in fact, what are the, uh, 
what are the particular headlines that we'd like to choose today? Yeah. Right? Like, so the whole purpose of this show is to bring in you know, different headlines from around the world. Yeah. We're doing our bit. We're doing we're not, our we're, bit. We're, yeah. we're not just talking well, about... Take us a good example. Yeah. D-Day, right? Yeah, absolutely. Big day. Okay, so it's all about the second so world how is, war. So how is that being commemorated? Well, what, what's there's the, a service going on. There's a service uh, there's, going on. You've got the king and queen have gone out there. When the, David Cameron's the gone to France. Yeah, uh, okay. Obama's over there. Obama's know? over there talking to Putin. There's all sorts of things happening which are drawing attention and wonderful. That's great. Yeah. And Putin's and, talking and to the new Ukraine you know, president. You if, know. If, if there's any community that recognizes the importance of being there to defend their nation and to defend humankind from oppression, which is what Nazism was, the Sikh community is very much at the front of the queue, right? What's happened in terms of this coverage? We know every time there is a commemoration of the Second World War, the Sikhs who, who sacrificed themselves not just in the Second World War but in the First World War as well, generally speaking, don't get recognized. Well, had... recent, in recent years, they have come out. More and more. Recently, but I think yeah. ma for many years, whether it be uh, people from Australia or New Zealand or from other places that yeah. they were not covered off as being yeah. people that were part of the forces that were fighting against the Nazis. Yeah. But, yeah, but recently but how did that happen, Savi? That yeah. didn't happen because BBC News decided one day when they woke up well, actually, I think we've forgotten an entire yeah. battalion. Are you, are you asking a, a great a question, what is newsworthy and what is not newsworthy? Well, what, what is newsworthy becomes what you want to be newsworthy. Okay, okay. here's here yeah. the thing. When I was a boy and you were a boy, there was BBC News and there was ITV. Right. Okay? We had to consume that as a diet of media. That's what they gave us. We had no say in it. We're not living in that age anymore. We've got very sophisticated younger people, and you yourself, I'm sure, know how to use social media to great effect. So ca cable channels, using the internet, uh, Twitter, social media, there are many, many different ways in which I know a lot of sick young men and women are actually getting their messages out there. When you have the technology available to you, it empowers individuals in a way that we never had when we were mm -hmm. children. Now you empower individuals, you don't have to rely upon mainstream media anymore. You've got to say to them, look, we create our own news, we create Absolutely. our own noise. Yeah. And eventually, guess what happens? The mainstream media, Sky, BBC, they pick up on it. Uh, you, would, you would hope so. You would hope well, so. I think they do, yeah. and I think, I think that's a, a but, but if you're in a country, in that, in that way. Yeah, see, but if you're in a country yeah. that happens to not allow women um, in certain uh, places in uh, the middle of the, uh, the world, where the part you are, the middle of the world, uh, that will not allow a person to drive, and suddenly they film themselves driving, yeah. um, or they switch the internet off uh, when a particular uh, moment suits them, yeah. then suddenly your social channels are gone. Yeah. And I did talk about uh, to Shamsher, and he said, yeah. well, eventually the human kind actually gets the news out somehow. Yeah. So even in the case of 1984, there are still eyewitness reports and there are still yeah. more and more. And I encourage you to go online to watch, uh, which has just recently been released, uh, a movie called um, The Widow's Colony that talks about you know, uh, all the people that survived the uh, genocide over in Delhi. Mm. So, so yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting subject yeah. in terms of well, newsworthiness. Well, for us, Saudi, we're not yeah. living in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, exactly. We're not living in North Korea. We're not living in China, where you're, where you're not given access to uh, mainstream media. Absolutely. Um, but those countries are coming under massive internal pressure. As you know, there's only so much you can do to suppress yep. internet communication. When we had the events that were taking place in Iran, not so long ago, in Egypt, not so long ago, in Libya, not so long ago, what were people doing? They were using their mobile phones, they were using to, mobile phones what to communicate what was happening. going out. Absolutely. And, they could, and that could not be controlled. Now, we have no excuse in the UK. Here we are, sitting here with the benefit of all this social media, and effectively there's very little restriction on what we can do. Listen, we're going to have to close it there. All right. uh, I'd like to say a personal thanks for coming out. I know you're a really busy person. Uh, it's been fantastic having you today. I wish you to come back and uh, share with us uh, your experiences and definitely fantastic uh, insight into uh, not necessarily the legal system, but also uh, advice in terms of, you know, you know, our, your view on, on really how we can propagate better information and, and communicate better and, uh, and be seen to be individuals that really can kind of contribute to society today. So it's a wonderful a bit of inspiration that you bring to the, to the show. So thanks for that. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Zoe. So just to sum up, you know, we were talking about 84. We were talking about um, the Vodafone situation just now. We were talking about China. And we can see that there are some kind of, uh, I guess, variances on what seems to be hot news to communicate. And sometimes uh, certain opportunist situations arrive uh, and that's not very good either for parts of the community. So I guess that's a, a signal to be more coordinated uh, and more professional and more, um, I guess, uh, knowledgeable about what we do and what we say to the media and how it's communicated. And hopefully they pick up the stories and understand the true stories and knowledge behind what took place, why it's still an issue and what can happen going forward to actually seek justice.
So thanks a lot, and so it's goodbye from me. Thanks a lot for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time around. Bye, Guji Gakalsa. Bye, Guji Gipadet.